got the keel and deadwood fared off to what we call the 75% stage. This is the point at which I'm going to start getting a whole lot more picky about exactly how much work I do and how I do it. I'm pretty close. I'm like within about an eighth of an inch of my finished shape down here. Probably not so far from that up here. And of course I've got, you know, the extreme ends which still need a bit of attention. I was mostly working on this yesterday and roughing it down towards the stem. And my shape changes along the way. It's got a completely round profile down here towards the, from, from about this point forward. Then back aft here it comes to just a slight sharp crease down through the midpoint and of course right through to it rounds off again at the stern and right there in the middle we have the ballast keel box coming up through this so after this is all planked we'll chop this portion right out of here and that's one of the reasons I did the dead wood ahead of time and built it so it would fit around the keel so I would have a guide so once this is all planked over I can very easily come from the inside using, I don't know exactly what tool I'll use to do it yet. I might just do, you know, a rough cut with uh, Sawzall even, and then finish up with a router, or maybe I'll use a multi-master tool to sort of do a plunge cut up through the bottom. I'll worry about that when I get there. I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. What I was concerned about was giving myself something to guide me, because cutting a hole in the bottom of a boat is very intimidating. It's one thing to cut just a rectangular hole for say a centerboard or a dagger board. That's not such a big deal. But cutting one that's sort of this goofy elliptical shape, well, that is a big deal. So you need something to guide you. From here on in, I think I'm gonna make myself a few templates from the drawings that are gonna show me exactly what these shapes need to be so I can lay them on here and guide my actions. But before I get on to doing that, let me show you about roughing out the other side. So the biggest area of concern, of course, is this dead wood here. There's quite a bit of material. A lot has to come off. Uh, so I can really hog things away fairly quickly, although there is going to be some grain that's running in opposite directions here that's going to make things a little more difficult. So you've got to take your time kind of getting started. But I'll show you how I do it as quickly as possible. So we're going to be using basically what's referred to as a slick. Now this isn't a true boat builder slick which would have the blade cranked over a little bit so that it clears the ferrule. This is really what you would refer to as a, uh, a like a timber framing paring chisel. But it's, it performs the same sort of job. And for the angle I'm working at, I don't need a proper slick. So basically my, my big concern here is getting rid of as much of this material as possible so I can get it to the point where I'm working with a plane. The way you make these work for you is you let the mass of the tool do a lot of the effort. And so some people think you use these like a plane and you just take off long, thin shavings. I don't believe that that's really true. These things, do, these things are doing a better job of removing larger amounts of material using these short strokes. This, of course, is the stuff you have to worry about where this is starting to split out. And I don't have to worry about it here because I've got so much material to take off, but you're always watching out for that.
Okay, once you've gotten as far as you can with the slick, the next thing to move to is a hand plane. And um, what I find is if you're working sort of anywhere very much above your bench level, then switching to the lightest tool you have is, is really worthwhile. So I've got an old wood-bodied plane here, which certainly sheds a pound off of the uh, experience. And because you're working up high, it really does make a big difference. Now my goal here is to try and reduce my steps down. I'm get, trying to work towards zero, um, but of course I don't want to get all the way there. So I'm leaving a, just a little bit of meat along the edge and then uh, leaving a little meat in the step. And then of course I'm staying back from my center line. And in, in each stage, I'm not trying to go flat. I'm trying to make sure that there is some shape to it. And to that end, I'm, part of the time, I'm just taking my plane and running it across grain like so. And part of the reason for that is just to get a feel for that shape. Taking sort of a swath that's about my arms span here, not quite, but sort of a comfortable range. Just working my way across the surface. And then I'll move down and do the next bit. Sometimes you gotta change directions too, so I know at least on the dead wood down here I need to change directions, but on the keel I gotta go that way. So I'll take that in two different steps. As I get down closer and closer, I'm gonna to have to start switching to a different plane or reducing the cutting depth of this one. This plane is a good one for general shaping, but I find if I start to get really, want to really get dialed in, I like to use a plane that I have an adjustable cutter on so that I can back off or grow my cutting thickness depending on how I need, how much I need it for a particular location. When you're steam bending something, um, well, when you're bending any piece of wood to a curve, if you need to control both ends of the curve. So wherever it, a curve ends, if you don't have the other end of your batten, for instance, or the part that you're trying to bend controlled by something, it's going to want to flatten out. And in this particular case, we steam bent this keelson, and because we did that, instead of laminating it, it flattens out a little bit towards the back end. Now, if even if you had laminated it, it still happens a little bit because you're still bending these things. So um, I need to fix that. And so what I'm doing here is, in order to fix this, I have um, allowed this keel to be raised up a little bit, just shimmed up a hair. And then I need to be able to fair off the back end. I've already started doing that. And I had about a quarter inch that I needed to remove. Uh, so the, a couple things I did is I created some blocking back here to fasten the keel to because I have a screw coming up from some blocking inside, but it's going to come through and hit my plane at some point. So I had to get that screw out of the way. And so I've moved to a new one to here. Make sure that that's deep enough. It's marginal. And I, I got to be careful that I don't hit that. So the next thing I need to do is come up with a way of judging how I'm doing. And so the way I'm doing that is I've got this little plywood template of my skeg. So if I park that right here, that's giving me the answer I need in terms of what the shape needs to be in here in order to jive up with that. If I take a batten and put it on here and I bend it across, then I can see how these two shapes are jiving. And that will allow me to judge whether or not I'm getting close. So I've got a good shape in back here. And then my fairing area is this sort of stretch. So I've sort of done a quick and dirty job of 
sort of knocking off the bulk of this here, but now I need to get more refined and figure out exactly what I need to do to finish this off properly. Okay, so if I come right down here and I bend my batten down and I'll use my hand to sort of try and mimic the curve of this skeg just a little bit. It looks like I am looking really good, very, very close, and I just have a tiny bit of material to pull off here. And I mean quite a tiny bit. So let me get my batten out of the way. shaves off. I'm not quite to my line, but I'm darn close. I just want to make sure I'm leveled off properly too while I'm at it. pretty good following my skig nicely however I'm just a I'm just a hair high back here a touch maybe but for the most part things are looking really nice and ultimately I still need to make this skig so if I need to make some further adjustments I can do that and in fact I'll definitely make the skig and ferret into the, what I do up here the goal is to try and come as close to our lines as we possibly can. That's looking pretty nice. Looking pretty darn nice. A couple more strokes to go and I'll be there. Anyhow, I just wanted to show you that little detail. Um, fairing battens are really important and you know it's not just something we use when we're lofting, it's something we use throughout the process of trying to dial things in and make one shape flow into another shape. And it's especially important to think about what happens uh, to shapes when you've got a reference that doesn't exist yet in your boat. How do you join up to that? Well, that's this is a good example of how you can use battens to figure that out. Okay, I'm getting closer and closer to my finished shape. And to that end, I've made up some little templates representing the cross sections of the boat at the keel at each station. And so with these, I can very quickly check and see just how close I'm actually getting. So my goal is to slowly bring it in down to what looks like a very uh, close approximation of what that shape needs to be. And now I'm going to slowly start coasting that towards the center line, which is my primary termination point. And of course, the shape of the hull down here is my secondary termination point. So once I get it to those spots, I'm done, really. So I get one, I take it a little ways, I get the next one, I take it a little ways, and then I try and fix the spot in between, which is going to have a little more material on it than either one of these does. And then I move on to the next station aft, and I'm going to keep working my way down that way. And I'll probably do this in a series of repetitions. So I'll go all the way down to one end in that manner, and then I'll start back at the front end, or maybe I'll work backwards. and. Um, dial in that finished shape a little bit more, working my way forward until I finally got the, the finished job. When I'm doing rough stuff, I'll sometimes work in one direction, and then when it comes down to doing fine stuff, I work in the other direction. And what I find is I like to have um, the material that I haven't dealt with yet to sort of be behind me if I'm working this way. And that way I'm sort of, I've refined this. I know I've always got more back here where I'm not really paying as much attention because my eye is always down towards this end. And then, um, so I can focus on getting that looking really nice, knowing I've got extra meat back here that I don't have to worry about quite so much. And as I work my way back, of course, I keep attending to that extra meat and refining the stuff that's left behind. Thank you. 
So I'll probably just be leaving a, a hair of material behind to deal with with the long board. It's looking pretty good. Ultimately, I've got to get this pretty fair because I'm using such light planking stock on here. It can be unduly uh, influenced by the shape of my mold. So. There's no self-fairing in the planking, so to speak. Yeah, that's looking real close. That's about ready for long boarding right there. So now I'm just going to move on to the next one. And I don't really, I'm not going to worry about this little, this last station X. It's going to get fared in along with number four. I want to thank all of you who follow me on various media platforms for all of your support and kind words over these years. But I especially want to thank my followers on Patreon. It's because of your generous support that I can make these videos on a regular basis. Thank you very much. For as little as a dollar per month, you can help support this channel. And at the higher pledge levels, I offer different forms of personal mentorship. For those of you who are not with us on Patreon, please consider joining us over there. There's a link in the description, or up in the corner. And so, of course, this is a curved surface, so you got to be careful that you're allowing your plane to follow that curve, um, because you wouldn't want to just create a real flat spot right here um, by forcing your plane to flatten it out, because that's what planes are really meant to do. And all I can tell you is that it just takes years of years of working with planes to get that feel for them where you can control where that blade hits all the time. The plane really does become an extension of your fingertips after a while. And in this light, I can't hardly even see what I'm doing. I should probably just turn off my lights and just work with some task lighting here, actually. Because that will make a big difference. Let's try that right now. I got the light coming in from the windows, and that helps. So it may not be obvious to the camera, but with the main lights off, I just have the raking light coming off of the task lamp here and the few lights that are around the shop, and you can sort of see the highlights across the surface. And in terms of trying to see what you're doing, you really can't get a better situation than this where it becomes really obvious what you're doing. All the shadows show up nicely. And now I can see the strokes that I'm making. Or at least I can see them a lot better before, because with all the lights on, I, with the, on this light wood, I'm pretty much ironically working in the dark. And I can see right now, I know this spot's good, getting close on this spot and I can see this mighty hump right there that I need to take off and I'm not worried about that right now because I'll come back and deal with it once you know where you got to go to you can work a lot faster I might even contemplate working with a spoke shave here a little bit. The nice thing about a spoke shave is I can, I can span a shorter, a broader surface with short strokes. So, you know, right there, that allowed me to cover a wide area with just a few strokes. And that got me like really, really close right there. 
I almost got to be careful not to do too much. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I know I'm getting very close. I got a little more meat to take off here. I'm almost inclined. I'd like to just have that come off with the long board, I think. So I'll. Uh, work these down. The spoke shave doesn't leave this flat a surface, of course, because it's got such a short sole on it. And if you see me working, you'll see how I sort of skew it. And that's my way of sort of giving it a longer sole. So instead of my sole being three quarters of an inch long, I skew it like this. And now I have a sole that's two inches long. With a skewed blade to boot. Likewise, you'll see me do the same thing with planes. If I'm working odd shaped surfaces, instead of running them long like this, I'll actually skew them so that instead of a long plane, now I have a short plane. I've got to go from, you know, nine inches down to uh, probably like six inches or something like that by skewing the plane like so. So your tools are more flexible than you think. You just have to readjust your attitude to the way you're using them. After some long boarding, I get a fit that looks like this. But wait a minute, let's turn off the lights and have another look at that. You can see I'm not quite there. So it's back to the drawing board, or rather it's back to the long board. Work it some more, and eventually we're gonna get this. It's a bunch of hard work, but the finished results look great, and we're ready for planking. <laughs>